Okay. Julia, are we good on your side? I feel very loud today. Yeah, it does sound good. Okay. The mics feel loud. I'm just, I won't do my normal, like, lean in. Okay. Well, good evening. Welcome to the February 9th City Council meeting, Capital City Council meeting. Uh, may we please have a roll call? Here. Councilman Clark. Here. Councilman Peterson. Here. 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 And Mayor Kaiser. Here. And if you'd all join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, any additions or deletions on the agenda? Staff is okay. And any additional materials? Staff has approved communication to the members of public for the upcoming council members agenda. Um, it just would be after the meeting that council members are going to be available, but it'll be included in the packet tomorrow. Thank you. All right. We can move on to oral communications. <clears throat> this allows time for members of the public to address the city council on any consent items on tonight's agenda or any topic um, that is not on the agenda. You'll have three minutes to speak. I don't see anybody in public. Okay, great. Thank you. So we can go to staff comments. I think our recreation division manager, Nikki Bryant, has a short update for everyone. Great. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. Um, at last council meeting, we had discussed a the next beach cleanup, and so I wanted to let um, everybody know that we have identified. February 19th as the next beach cleanup. Um, Jerry Jensen as well, along with BIA um, representatives are helping to champion this uh, cleanup. And it will be at 9 a.m. on that Sunday following the benefit concert. Um, this cleanup will focus on trash and we will not be doing any debris removal from the beach as it is assisting nature in the replenishment of the sand. So if you are available, we encourage you to come out. Thank you. Great, thank you for organizing that. Anything else from staff? Okay, any council comments? Just uh, one little announcement about uh, receiving an email about Mid County Senior Center having their Mardi Gras fundraiser on uh, February 25th. Uh, tickets are available at Eventbrite and at the center. There'll be dinner provided or cooked by our former mayor and chef, Michael Termini. The Little Big Band will be playing uh, swing dance music. Sounds like a good time. Um, <laughs> You know, they do a lot for us in the community, so it'd be nice to help them out with their fundraiser. They were closed for like two years during the pandemic, so it'd be nice if we could help out. Great, thank you. Okay, we can go on to the consent. All items listed as consent items will be enacted in one motion um, in the form listed below. Public. No, we don't need to. No. Right. Okay. <laughs> Do we have a motion on the table for the consent? I'll motion to approve the consent agenda. I'll second. Great. That's a motion and a second for the consent. Maybe we have a roll call. Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Thank you. So that can take us on to general government. 
We have item 7A. This is um, the prospect walking path repair and continued maintenance. The recommendation tonight is to provide the direction to staff on the repair, continued maintenance, and future use of the prospect walking path. We have Jessica. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council members. Some um, storm damage to the pathway has necessitated this item in front of you this evening. Um, a little background, the pathway on Prospect is behind the homes um, adjacent to the RTC rail right-of-way. It consists of a quarter mile path and three stairways from 49th to Worth Road. And it's about three to five feet wide at its most narrow parts and that's closest to Worth Road. Um, there are three staircases. One is a wood block stairway, one is a metal stairway, and another is a more substantial stairway there on the right that goes all the way down to Wharf Road. Uh, that stairway was rebuilt by the city in 20, 2006, including that uh, railing there to keep people off of the uh, railway. The other two stairways, though they have been maintained, have not been substantially reconstructed since the city has taken ownership of them. Um, a little more background on the walking path. The city went into an agreement with then the uh, Union Pacific Railroad in 2004 to maintain, reconstruct the uh, stairways and the connecting walking path. In 2006, the city reconstructed that stairway on Wharf Road for about $30,000, which included some um, community donations. And then in 2012, the RTC acquired the railway. So now the agreement the city has is between the RTC and the city. Um, so during these past winter storms, there's been some uh, significant slip outs on the uh, walkway. There's two minor ones um, right there across from Opal Street. And then the largest one being about 1300 square feet behind uh, 1400 and 1410 Prospect Avenue. Uh, the red hatchings on this um, figure here also included in your agenda packet are um, encroachments. So that's between the uh, parcel line and the uh, walkway where people have had yards and imp private improvements into the public RTC right of way. Uh, here's a close up image of that larger 1300 square foot slip out. Uh, the city and staff has been in contact with the RTC. Uh, the RTC is the owner of this hillside has indicated that they would um, stabilize the uh, slope, but they would not repair it. So without a repair by the city, there would be no usable pathway uh, on, this, on this area of the trail. So that brings us to our options before you tonight. Uh, the first one is to more or less abandon the pathway, to approach the RTC to uh, get out of the agreement, which would require us per the agreement to remove the staircases and to restore the property to its original condition, which is more or less the condition it is right now, less that more significant stairway. Um, the RTC would again stabilize the slope failures, but there would be no traversable pathway um, behind Prospect. The other two options are to repair the pathway either in place or uh, further back um, into those private encroachments. So to repair to fail the, the failed slope to pre-storm conditions, we would apply for FEMA funding, which we have for many projects around the city. So this would be included as one of those projects. And then once we went through the federal design and bidding requirements, which is a lengthy process, um, as opposed to when we repair something with our own city funds, um, then we could repair the walking path in place. Another potential option is to apply for hazard mitigation funds, um, which is also a lengthy process with FEMA, but then it allows us to construct something better than what we had before. Uh, that would also require us to work with the RTC, who has indicated that they are willing to work with the city in removing some of those encroachments so the walkway is further back in a more stable place and presumably there will be less slip outs in the future. Um, both of those also, uh, require a right of entry with the RTC, which is something that is standard, but also is a part of the process. Um, FEMA requires all of our public assistance funding for all of our projects. So the wharf and other damages we've had to be put in priority order. Um, I would say that this would be considering we have the wharf and some other more significant damages around the city. This would be a lower priority project for city staff. And then uh, here's that image again, a little closer up with the slope failure on the oval there and the uh, private encroachments, which range to about eight to 12 feet uh, into the RTC right of way. 
So staff is seeking direction on the repair and continued maintenance of this pathway, and I am able to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Any council questions? I have one. Mm. Um, can you tell me a little bit about, and if there's like anything pressing, if we were to go with option three and work with the RTC and await FEMA funding, is there anything pressing in terms of safety or impact on, on the residents in that area or anything like that? It doesn't threaten the homes that it's behind currently, and it's not anticipated that it would, um, except maybe the encroachment, which we'd be trying to remove. Uh, it wouldn't be passable, so it would be, remain blocked off as it is now. And since you mentioned that this is a lower priority, oh. should we get the FEMA funding for it? Um, is there a chance that we, we wouldn't get enough? And if so, what's the plan after that? What would be some of the other? Would we just go back to option two or option one at that time? Um, so chances are that we would get enough funding. It would just be a lengthy process. I will say for the option two that the limit of FEMA funding is 18 months from the emergency. So by low priority, I do mean after other projects we did, but it would be within 18 months per the FEMA guidelines. Okay, thank you. I had a question just about how much uh, it is gonna cost. And uh, if we don't do anything now, do we need to worry about closing it since it's a hazard or are we gonna leave it as it is? It is blocked off right now. Um, and the repair for both um, to remove the encroachment or to not would be approximately $50,000. Um, that's, inclu that's including the fact that it has to be a federally bid project. Um, and it's the reimbursement by FEMA, I think the city ends up paying about 12% of that. I have a question. Um, is this path or the stairs uh, required to be ADA accessible? Um, so it is required to be ADA accessible for a rural footpath, which really just requires it to be a certain width. Um, at the narrowest point, it can be three feet, which it is. It's mostly okay. five feet down the path. It also requires it to be like a stable um, surface, which beyond, besides the part that's obviously damaged, it is. Um, so the photo actually right there um, with the tarping and everything, is this the RTC's version of stabilization or? <laughs> no. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, okay, I just wanted to make sure. And so, yeah, I, I wonder too, do you feel like if we close off the pathway, having that significant staircase that we've had for a while, is that going to sort of, I don't know, just sort of people are gonna to wanna to use that, but would we close it off at the bottom of the stairs or? Maybe? We'd be required to remove it. Oh, remove the, okay, the one by the trestle. Yes. Gotcha, okay, thank you. All right, do we have any public comment? Fair enough. Great. Okay, any council comment, deliberation? I have some thoughts. Yes, please. Um, Okay, so I have a couple of thoughts on this. I like option three about moving it back in the long term because I feel like that's gonna be the safer way to do it. My concern about moving forward with that option right now is can you go back to the picture that shows the encroachments? Those encroachments are actually backyards. Those are people's backyards right now. So you can kind of see there's a pool or a hot tub or something there. And I think that's gonna be a lot more difficult process to get into that space to build a path right there than just asking the RTC for help on because it's technically RTC property. So technically that's encroaching into RTC property. However, because of the whole rail trail process that they're going through, I have a feeling that eventually RTC is going to get that encroachment anyways, um, or get that space back anyways. And so my thought is we had the um, resiliency fund that we put together during COVID. And even if it would be a low priority, you know, within 18 month project, that we could take the $50,000 from the resiliency fund, which would then be reimbursed from FEMA funding, um, rebuild the path where it is now, and then should uh, you know the RTC later come through to build their path along this rail trail situation on their property, um, you know potentially see if they want to you know move our our path that that would be uh, on the property we now have rights on onto essentially their path um, and make it further away from the cliff that is, has just failed. So that's my thoughts uh, about it right now, just for the sake of conversation. 
So at that point, um, if they did come back to take back the encroachments, you you think maybe the trail would just be widened and we would just keep it? Oh. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if, okay. if the trail would be, I mean, it's technically their property, right. but I mean, it's possible the trail would be widened or moved moved up. Um, yeah, it just seems it seems a little bit like a hard fight, a hard battle for us to fight to get these in, into this space um, when the RTC might be doing it themselves. Right. Um, but again, just for the sake of conversation. And it sounds like option three is is going to get us the best trail and cost the city the less. Is that is that correct? Overall cost for option two and three would be about the same. It's just the process of the encroachments, which isn't a direct cost to the city, but would be staff time to work with the RTC to address it. I have a quick question, um, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so should we, the city, repair the walking path that's in place, apply for FEMA funding to reimburse ourselves for that, and await for the RTC to re to relocate the walking path when they eventually get to the encroachment process for those properties. Do you have any sense of a timeline for that? Like how long, have we, do you have any idea of? Sounds, that's usually a very long process. Right. So we could be waiting years would, yeah. for that process is my assumption. So if we do that and we await for the relocation or the, for the RTC to deal with, the, with that piece of it, what are we missing? So our path would just be minimal, or it would just be the small little one that we have. Are we still, to Council Member Peterson's point, like are we still ADA compliant? Are we, we're just kind of going back to status quo. Is that safe to assume? <clears throat> yes, okay. <laughs> I, I think the, the one thing that we would be potentially open to is, is that it could slide again next year. Because the, with the path where it is right now, it's just very susceptible to the slip out. If it could move back, it'd be more resilient. But it would be just basically taking us back to the situation that we had before the storm. Okay. And the funds that Council Member Brown, Vice Mayor Brown suggested, um, those aren't uh, restricted dollars and we can easily replenish that once we get the FEMA money. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. It's a general fund. Okay. I think I've got what I need, yeah. I have a question. Um, is there any way to make the path um, more permanent or more secure against heavy rains without dealing with the moving into the encroachments? Like, is there a way that we could just spend a little bit more money and make it more permanent where it is? A little bit more, no. Um, you can always build a retaining wall, and, and that would have to be with the RTC's permission. But that would be the only way without moving it back into the encroachment to make it more stable. Well, maybe abundantly obvious, I'll just say that that's probably an order of magnitude. If oh, not more yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So if we're talking about a $50,000 project, we're probably talking about a... 250. 250? Mm -hmm. Retaining wall? Yeah. I was going to go 500. <laughs> 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 okay, I guess I it brings me to another question as well. So if... Regardless of, say, we're choosing either between two and three, um, they're, they're also both similar timelines, or? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of no, your question. No, that's okay. Um, <laughs> I was not speaking very eloquently. Between option two and three, mm -hmm. they're around the same cost and around the same time frame, or? It would be around the same cost. The time frame to deal with the encroachments would presumably be more. Okay. I will say that the RTC is going out on encroachments on their property right now in regards to the rail trail. So I do know they have a team dealing with those items specifically, but that is also specifically for the rail trail. <coughs> okay, Th thank you. I'm prepared to make a motion. Sure. Um, so I'd like to make a motion that the city move forward using our resilience dollars to repair the walking path that's in place and to apply for the FEMA reimbursement dollars as noted in your presentation this evening and um, as we await for the RTC to determine the relocation outcomes for the inland um, walking path in their own timeline. I'll second. Great, we have a second. Aye. 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 Thank you. Passes unanimously. Okay. 
Up next, um, we have item 7B, which I'm actually going to recuse myself from as um, my employer, Paradise Beach Grill. We may um, be eligible for funds or may be open during this time, which would result in a conflict of interest. So I will turn it over to Vice Mayor Brown. All right. Sure, it is. That's what Chloe just said. Oh, yeah. Give the mayor a second. All right, we're moving on to item 7B, which is a storm update and general special event permit for a Capitola Village benefit concert. Our recommended action is to receive the update regarding the 2022-2023 winter storm event and approve a general special event, event permit for a Capitola Village benefit concert, including an encroachment permit and amplified sound permit. And I'll turn it over to staff. Getting the hang of using this portable mic. All right, so I'm going to kick this one off, and then Chief Galley will take it over. Um, get to the first slide, please. I think you guys are all aware that in early January of this year, we uh, ultimately declared it a disaster based on the storm damage that we sustained on January 5th. Uh, since that time, we have expanded on our list of dignitary visits. Uh, yesterday, we received a visit from the Lieutenant Governor, who came and toured the village and met some of our local businesses. Uh, we had the beach cleanup that was... Uh, done on the 22nd, and then we've opened the small business recovery here at City Hall. It's been serving our businesses both in Capitola as well as regionally, uh, helping them get the services and the recovery dollars that they're entitled to. And then we've also partnered with the Community Foundation, who's helped develop a fundraising effort to help support those affected by the storms. Next slide, please. So just some quick updates from different departments. Uh, our public work staff with the wharf engineers uh, and also partnered with the uh, harbor staff uh, got, took a boat out to the wharf to tour the site. The damage was pretty much as expected. The good news is that the buildings were not significantly damaged. Um, they're obviously getting pretty long in the tooth, but they weren't significantly damaged in the storm event. Uh, so there wasn't any major surprises in the site visit. Uh, public Works staff has completed emergency repairs to the Riverview Path. Um, the path is now traversable, and it was $46,000 for the temporary repair, and that'll be part of the FEMA reimbursement submittal that we have. Um, we've also been working with the property owners who actually own the path along the Riverview Corridor and have helped secure donated uh, decomposed granite uh, to, to replenish the decomposed granite for the path. And then obviously, as you just heard this evening, the staff, staff is working, working frantically uh, on all the other storm damage and developing the plans and the process by which we will be repairing each one. Next slide, please. So from the Community Development Department, Pizza My Heart opened up on the 4th. Margaritaville opened, I think it was last week, maybe this weekend. <clears throat> uh, Paradise, I understand, is going to be opening within the week. And then Zelda's went to the Planning Commission to get some feedback about replacement window options for their back windows that face the ocean, mostly because the building is actually, uh, interestingly, I didn't know this before this, but it's listed as historic. So there was some concern about whether they could just replace like for like or do something. I think they were looking to maybe upgrade the situation a little bit. Next slide, please. <clears throat> From the financial side, we've submitted our initial estimate of public damage, which is the 2.625 figure, uh, $2,625,000. Uh, we've actually gotten updated numbers for the wharf, and interestingly, our, our first figure, which was a million dollars, looks like it was remarkably close. I think the, the, the engineer's estimate for the wharf damage is 960 or 950, somewhere in that range. So. Looks like we're pretty close on that figure. And then there's a big FEMA coordination meeting that's taking place next week on the 15th, where we're going to be getting more feedback and information. We've also submitted our claim, uh, initial insurance claim to our adjusters with $2.5 million in damages. We also will be submitting for what's called business interruption insurance, which is when the city has lost revenue due to uh, covered events. That would be things like the parking meters in the downtown, in the village and the rents that we receive off the wharf. Uh, and the, yeah, the adjusters at this point were, are working on it and we'll be hearing back from them. So just a real quick explanation. Essentially the way this works is the insurance will be in first position. So we will do our best to get an insurance refund rebate and then 
what insurance doesn't come cover will be part of our FEMA claim. Next slide, please. So looking ahead, um, Nikki Bryant mentioned the next beach cleanup on February 19th at 9 a.m. That, that Jerry Jensen is coordinating along with help from the BIA. Uh, we are also planning on an update for council um, about the wharf. Um, I know everyone has so many questions about what's going to happen, and you've heard me talk about the goal of trying to have it open a year from the damages, which would be 11 months from now, I guess. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that and what the different options look like next meeting. And then there's a potential benefit concert that we are uh, in front of you this evening to seek approval of the special event permit, and Chief Daly will cover that. <clears throat> Great. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> And so as we kind of follow through the next steps, um, you know, actually shortly after that first cleanup, um, there was just a lot of talk about what's the next thing that we could do. And there was this like mention around the community of doing some sort of benefit concert. And so um, it, was, it was really apparent that a lot, of, a lot of people in the community really wanted to step up and, 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 and help with this. And so I know for a fact that Andy Hewitt from Britannia Arms um, had the idea of maybe doing a benefit concert. And so, um, he reached out to a, a friend of his who is Eric uh, Kelslow with Sierra Nevada to, to bring the, the beer idea of a beer uh, concert. And so what we did is we um, started getting uh, together like a good leadership team and Mary Beth uh, with the BIA, we reached out to the BIA, the chamber, and everyone was real supportive of it. The leadership from our rec recreation department really stepped up. And so the idea of, of this benefit concert, and I'll kind of move to the next one, is Beyond the Flood benefit concert. And so Mary Beth submitted a, an application for a special general special event. Um, the benefit concert is modeled um, after the Twilight concerts, um, essentially down in the Esplanade. And so they applied for a new general special event permit. In order to do that, it has to come before council for approval. And that's why we're here tonight. Um, so essentially, the, this one-day special event permit, if you look at the, the map up on the, on the screen there, kind of orientate yourself, the, the beach would be down on the lower end of the screen, and then that upper parking lot is the Swenson parking lot. Um, similar to the, to the uh, Wednesday night concerts, at the, the stage area would be the, where the performance occurs, but what we're doing is we're expanding the profile of the event and extending out a little bit. So if you look at, um, in front of Britannia Arms, there'll be like a road closure there, and then we're also closing off the entrance to the palm trees there. And what we'll do, if, if approved, is that that would be the, the venue area. Alcohol would not be allowed outside the venue area. Um, Sierra Nevada, like I said, has donated all the, the beer and the beer truck um, with 100% of the proceeds going back to the, uh, to the, the people that were affected by the, the flooding. Um, the anticipated attendance is between one to 2,000 people. Like I said, um, Mary Beth and the chamber and the BIA were supportive of the beer garden. They've done all the organizing as far as selling the tickets. So it'd be essentially like, kind of like the art and wine where they'll do a wristband check and then um, they purchase the tickets, the tickets, then they go um, to buy the, the beer and then all the proceeds go to, um, to the victims of the flood. Um, we're gonna add additional hygiene sta stations and then trash and recycling. Um, and then the Swenson, uh, Barry Swenson, the lot up there, they've allowed, or they're agreeing to allow us to use that area for the bands. So we, they can set up, we'll have recycling there, and then they can access the stage from that back area. So the idea is to do a benefit concert. It'd be Saturday, February 18th, which is President's Day weekend, which is not this weekend, but the next weekend. Uh, the, the, the idea is to have a, an event from noon to 6 p.m. And it would start with uh, the Jive Machine, which is a, a band, a local band here, and then followed by Alex Lucero. And then the final act would be the Joint Chiefs with Tony Lindsay, which is apparently a singer from Santana. And like I said, Sierra Nevada Brewery is the one that donated all the, the beer truck and the, and the beer. And then all the proceeds will be returned to the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County. And with that, I'm open to any other questions. Actually, if I could back up, we're really trying to encourage, um, back up to this, uh, the bike. We have a bike corral at the, at the entrance here, um, right by the, um, on the Esplanade there. So we're really encouraging people to bike, bike down. We'll have a bike corral there. And then 
Um, David Ling also offered their parking lot, so they're gonna, we partnered with David Ling, and then I think Harbor High is gonna staff that as doing a, a like a, a valet parking, a bike parking lot there as well. So with that, if you have any questions, I'm here. All right, uh, any questions? No questions. All right, public comment. Come on up. Uh, good evening, council members. I'd like to add one thing to the menu over here. Uh, Congressman Jimmy Panetta will be here uh, for the concert between 2 and 4 p.m. that day. So uh, I hope that helps with, the, with what we're doing. And uh, so I'll just invite the congressman, and he said yes. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Got some dignitaries at our concert. Uh, any further public comment? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to council. Any comments? Well, one of the comments I have is that it, this is probably gonna be a great thing for the community. Fortunately, we have lots of practice with our Wednesday night concerts. Um, I like the idea of the bike rack down at David Ling, to have less people riding bikes through a congested area. So that's, that's a really good idea. Um, just wonder what, what the cost with your, with your overtime officers, and do you have a budget? It's coming from anywhere, or, or do you anticipate having overtime? Or? Uh, so we are going to staff it with uh, with a couple uniformed folks, and so that would just be a regular rate that they, they incur. But it's a, it's a city sponsorship. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other comments, questions? I'll just say, um, yeah, I, I'm really excited about uh, the idea for this concert. Everyone loves some live music and supporting our city. Um, and yes, thank you to uh, Vicki at David Ling. She reached out to offer that parking lot for the, the bike valet. And uh, the more we can get people out of their cars and walking into the village or biking into the village, the better. So it's um, all the better for this exciting concert. With that, no further comments. I think we'll entertain a motion. Anyone I'd like to make it? a motion. So what would your motion be? Motion would be to move to uh, have this great concert here in Capitol. All right. So are you moving to approve the permit and the encroachment permit and the amplified sound permit? Yes. All righty. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second with an amendment to your motion if you, if you would accept that we also waive the fees associated with the permits um, that we, the city requires. Would you accept my? Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. All right, let's get ready to rock. Uh, and let's bring the mayor back in. Responsibly. Let's get ready to rock responsibly. And thanks, Neil, for all your work you've been putting out there. Thank you. Much easier to do that on Zoom. <laughs> okay. So we will move on down to item 7C. It is our citywide housing element. Recommended action is to receive the presentation, introducing the housing element update, provide feedback regarding the planned update process. And we have Katie. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, tonight, I'm going to give you an update on the housing element. We have two panelists uh, through Zoom. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Veronica Tam of Veronica Tam and Associates, <laughs> as well as Brett Stinson of RRM Design. Um, they've- Good evening. Welcome, Brett. Hi. Um, so this evening, uh, first I just want to say we have our work cut out for us. Uh, as you know, with the housing element update, uh, we've been assigned over 1,300 new units to locate in the city of Capitola. This will probably be one of the biggest lifts that I, as the community development director, has ever taken on within any community. So we've got our work cut out for us. It will be a heavy lift, but I'm glad we have a, a 
fantastic team. Uh, Veronica has is the housing expert on the team, and she has a, uh, a record of success um, with the, the State Housing and Community Development, HCD. So we've got a great team, and thank you for being here tonight. And Veronica, with that, I'll hand over the present. You can share your slideshow and begin your presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna double check so everybody can see the PowerPoint presentation. Um, is it? Perfect. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for having me. And uh, as Katie mentioned, this is going to be uh, one of the most critical projects you're gonna um, undertake in this particular year. The housing element, I just wanna go through very quickly tonight. What What is that? why we're doing what we're doing, and really um, focus on the most critical components of the housing element, the regional housing needs allocation, and how to uh, achieve that. Veronica, your mic seems to go in and out, so I'm not sure if it's moving, but. Oh, I think it's because I'm leaning forward and maybe uh, sometimes like sitting back. So uh, is, it, is this better right now? That sounds much better, thank you. Okay. Uh, the housing element is part of your general plan. It is one of the seven required elements of your general plan, and it has some really um, specific statutory requirements uh, in terms of looking at the needs of your community, not only your current needs, but also projected housing needs into the future. Uh, it's a little different from the rest of the general plan in that it has to be uh, updated every eight years with a straight um, a straight uh, statutory uh, deadline for us in the MBAC region, it, it is uh, December 31st, 2023. Uh, it's also different from the rest of the general plan in that it has to be reviewed by a state agency for compliance of state law. The agency responsible for this is the housing department, uh, the State Department of Housing and Community Development, HCD. You will be hearing about HCD um, quite often throughout this year. When we update the housing element, uh, very important that we do community outreach and make sure that we obtain uh, input from the community regarding needs and also policies. Uh, we also need to have the housing element, as I mentioned before, reviewed by the state agency. Uh, the HCD review of the housing element takes place in two stages, one at the draft level and then at the uh, adopted level. Uh, after you have a housing element that's uh, adopted and also uh, certified by the state for compliance with state law, we move on to implementation over the next eight years. As I mentioned before, the housing element has really uh, uh, strict requirements for content. We need to look at the needs. We need to make sure we take community outreach uh, seriously. And we also need to look at the constraints and opportunities you have. We also need to look at what worked in the past and what um, can be modified into the future. And all of that really results in a housing action plan that you will be uh, held accountable for over the next eight years. When we send the housing element to the state for review as required by state law, the one thing that we're trying to achieve is something called finding of substantial compliance with state law. And with that finding of substantial compliance, in the event of a lawsuit, you will be presumed to have a legally adequate um, housing element. And so it would be up to whoever is suing the city uh, to prove the other one, to approve otherwise. You also have the ability to, uh, to apply for state funds, particularly housing and transportation funds. Without a compliant housing element, you are either not eligible or you're marked down in terms of being competitive, um, your competitiveness in the application. The housing element, you have to accommodate your regional housing needs for allocation. Just like uh, Katie mentioned, it's almost 1,500 units. If you're unable to accommodate that from a land use perspective, then that whatever you are not able to accommodate is rolled over to the next cycle. Now, the regional housing needs allocation, I'll go into that a little bit further uh, later, but it is not a requirement to build the housing units. It's a planning goal. It's not a production obliga obligation. It's a planning goal in relation to your capacity uh, for accommodating the units. 
So the other thing that um, is important when you get the housing element in compliance with state law is you avoid the rezoning limitation. If we're able to get the housing element certified by the state within 120 days of the statutory deadline, then you do have three years to comply or complete your rezoning. But if you're unable to get the certification within that time frame, then you only get one year to do any kind of rezoning for capacity if you're required to do that. But again, we'll go into a little bit more further on that. There are also uh, ramifications uh, if, you, if you have to do rezoning past the statutory deadline. We'll go into that a little bit further. Without a housing element compliance state law, you're most um, more at risk of being um, sued by, on the housing element. The housing element is the most frequently litigated element of the entire general plan. And the state law has changed that in that anybody with an interest in housing can bring a litigation, uh, can bring a lawsuit um, against the jurisdiction. If you are um, in a situation where you're being sued by uh, a nonprofit a developer, a private resident, or a state agency, uh, the court has the ability to suspend your authority to issue building permits. And this is not just housing building permits. This is any building permit. Um, there is also a very archaic um, provision of the government code um, that is is um, a builder's remedy. If you do not have a compliant housing element, that particular um, uh, provision of government, government code would not um, means that you will not be able to deny an affordable housing project uh, based on inconsistency with the city's general plan and zoning. Uh, this is a, a 30 year old provision that hasn't been used um, in the last 30 something years, but are not, are not surfacing right now. The regional housing needs allocation or regional housing needs assessment, it's a top-down process. It starts with the state, HCD, projecting how much growth um, in the entire state and allocating it in the seven regions uh, in the state. MBAC uh, is um, the three county region. MBAC gets about 33,000 units and each county and each jurisdiction gets an allocation. So in Capitola, our number is 1,336 units. Um, you see that it's much uh, higher than what you are accustomed to in previous cycles of the housing element. In the fifth cycle housing element, your allocation was only 143 units. Uh, the sixth cycle is 100, um, 1,306. There are a few reasons why your, your numbers are so high. One, these, uh, the sixth cycle housing element beta was conducted um, uh, at the peak of the housing market. Whereas the fifth cycle housing element, the arena projection was conducted during the, the, the implosion of the housing market. Uh, there are also new state laws uh, that were passed in 2016, 17, and 18. Those all change how the arena is calculated. And specifically, it adds on to not only a projection for future growth, but it makes also jurisdictions responsible for the lack of housing production in the previous 20 years. And that about 60% or 67% of the arena for this new six cycle comes from uh, the fact that there hasn't been a production in the last six years, last 20 years. Um, so moving forward, um, that we want to talk about just, you know, in identifying the sites for the arena, there are really uh, critical reasons that you need to uh, look at the site. We need to be specific. We need to have sites that are available and um, suitable for us. Then we need to uh, make sure that the sites are consistent with the overall vision of the community. We do have the ability to look at different types of how, um, um, opportunities like redevelopment of existing properties, uh, assessor, accessory dwelling units, and also state-owned properties and also um, some other um, educational and religious institutions. Uh, as I mentioned, there's been a lot of new state law um, in recent years, and some of that will uh, really impact the way that you are looking for um, that you're looking uh, 
have how to achieve the, the region housing needs allocation. One um, important change in state law is something called no net loss, SB 166. It really requires you, in, in previous cycles, when you look at the site's inventory and your ab ability to meet the arena, it's a one-shot deal when you're dealing, when you're updating the housing element. SB 166 changed all that, that you have to have a, a capacity, enough capacity to be able to meet the arena throughout the eight year planning period of the housing element. So when sites are developed with fewer units than we assumed in the housing element, or they're developed with fewer affordable units than expected in the housing element, you are required to make sure that you have remaining capacity for your remaining arena. Because of this no net loss requirement, you have to, uh, it's a recommendation that you buffer your site's capacity, uh, identify enough sites for at least 15 or 30% above your arena. Otherwise, you may be engaged in rezoning and upzoning continuously as you run into a situation where you have a net loss in capacity to the extent that you would not be able to meet your arena. There are also new state laws uh, that uh, allows you to look at uh, sites that might not be uh, opportunity sites in the past. Uh, one is AB 1851. This is Congress, um, uh, Congregational and Religious Institution Properties. You do not have to replace, or the, the, uh, the property can partner with a nonprofit organization and put housing on site either on their extra parking so, uh, surface parking area, uh, unused area, or, uh, or we build part of their, their uh, existing properties, but they do not have to replace the parking on site up to 50% of the parking lost. Uh, the other new piece of legislation that just got passed last year is 2295. That allows how, um, housing to be provided on educational and institutional sites um, for their employees, such as school districts or, um, or uh, community colleges, or maybe even hospitals, they can provide housing on site without requiring rezoning of the properties. So later on, Katie is going to go over some of the site strategies, but something that we wanted to talk about is definitely ADUs. Uh, it is a potential um, affordable housing or more affordable housing opportunities in communities like uh, Capitola. We do have the ability to look at the historical trends of ADU construction in the city and then project into the future how many you can get. Um, in the future. Uh, it, one thing that I mentioned before is the institutional um, uh, properties and providing housing on it. This is something that has become a very popular trend uh, as a lot of churches and or religious institutions are going online and they're not a, um, then they don't need the the that much um, uh, physical space anymore. Uh, uh, an example of this is Garden Grove is working with the um, United Methodist Church as taking the site out. Uh, um, of the parking area and building 47 affordable units for seniors and families. And uh, in exchange, the, uh, uh, the church actually get, you know, a community center offices and, and also uh, have uh, some other nonprofit organizations to be on site. So when we look at the site in, um, inventory, when we try to find sites for your regional housing needs allocation, there is a something called a default density. For a community your size, uh, what the 20 units to the acre is considered to be zoning uh, that is adequate to facilitate lower income housing. Now, at 20 units to the acres, it doesn't mean that your building housing at market is going to be affordable. It means that at 20 units to the acre, the density is feasible so that the amount of subsidies would be uh, reasonable for a, um, an affordable housing project to be financially feasible, be, to be competitive for funding at the state or federal level. Um, so 20 units to the acre is the quote unquote magic number we're looking for uh, if when, uh, when we're looking for sites 
um, that are feasible for lower income arena. Uh, within your current uh, zoning districts, there are a couple of places where we can look at it, um, certainly mobile home parks, but we don't know if there are a lot of you know, new mobile home parks are going to be developed. It may not actually work. Um, in your mixed use village and, and neighborhood and also commercial um, community commercial zoning districts, it doesn't have a maximum density, but it doesn't, um, uh, what we need to do though in identifying sites in those areas and capacity in those areas is to demonstrate what is the average density that have been uh, um, uh, achieved or, uh, or achievable within those um, districts. So even though it may not establish it may not have established a maximum density in estimating potential capacity. We're not allowed to, to just assume you know, any number. We have to use historical development trends. So um, some of the areas that currently at 20 units to the acre would be the affordable housing overlay and the village residential overlay. Mentioned before, there are some really um, new changes to state law and critical um, deadlines that we have to deal with when it comes to uh, the rezoning. Most likely we will have to do some rezoning um, in order to meet your 1400 or so units of RENA. The statutory deadline of the housing element is uh, December 31st, 2023. If we are able to do all the rezoning before this statutory deadline, then the housing element is, um, it doesn't have to include a rezone program to do the rezone later on. Now, if you're able to do that, there are some um, uh, advantages um, in order to, you know, for, for the rezoning to occur before the statutory deadline. Uh, I mentioned before there's a default density. If you're able to do the rezoning, the default density is the maximum density of that zone to be 20 units to the acre. Now, if we cannot do the rezoning before the statutory deadline, the state law says, well, the minimum density of that zone is also 20 units to the acre. Because you cannot have a zone that has the minimum density the same as your maximum density you have to push up the maximum density to beyond 20 units to the acre and give it a range maybe at 24, 25 units to the acre. So if we are able to do this, uh, the rezoning before the end of this year, the zone that would be considered feasible for lower income can be zero to 20 units to the acre. If we cannot complete the rezoning before the end of the year and have to push beyond um, next year, or beyond the two next year, then the zone that is considered to be feasible for lower income has to be 20 to 24 or 25 units to the acre. So that's the, the, the difference, um, and, and it's important. Another thing that um, is um, a requirement is if we have to do the rezoning next year, then each site you identify has to be large enough to accommodate at least 16 units. And the third thing is, if you have to, if you have to do the rezone, if you have to complete the rezoning next year, then every zone that you rezoned, if they include every property that you're rezoning, if they include 20% of the units as lower income uh, housing, then the project has to be permitted by right without discretionary review and without CEQA. So these are all the important things that we have to keep in mind about how much, you know, to what extent you want to really um, try the hardest you can to get this rezoning done by the end of the year. <laughs> so, um, there are also other uh, requirements. Because most likely we are going to rely on uh, mixed use properties for your arena. If rezoning happens after the statutory deadline, then, and you rely more more than 50% of your lower income arena on mixed use properties, 
then the mixed use uh, properties have to allow for standalone residential. Um, and for the, if, if a mixed use project um, um, does go into those areas, no more than 50% of the floor area can be mixed, uh, can be non-residential. So you cannot have um, a, a large, um, you, you cannot require a mixed use project to, to have more than 50% of uh, the floor area. So all of these gives you really uh, important uh, uh, you know, reasons to, well, to think about how you're going to pursue the rezoning, the timing of your rezoning how much um, effort and resources you're going to del um, allocate Kate, um, uh, to staff in the next few months. Uh, just one thing that Katie wants to remind everybody that um, rezoning requires a six months review period for, for local adoption and certification by the Coastal Commission. So that adds a wrinkle to um, the overall timeline. So um, some of the potential housing sites areas, um, Katie is gonna talk about that, but, um, and I'm gonna actually pass it over to Katie. Thank you. So just to oversimplify that last, the rezoning, it's very important that not only do we update our housing element this year, but that we rezone to meet our numbers. Otherwise, we're subject to a lot of, um, uh, of uh, other state regulations that, I don't think our public would be too, our, our residents would be too happy about. So by June, um, by it would have to be adopted um, by December, it, but it needs yeah. a six months review period. So we need to rezone by June. Yeah, yeah okay. the six months was me estimating like from the time we write the ordinance to the time it gets certified by the Coastal Commission, like best case scenario. So it's really, it's gonna happen fast. So it's really more like May. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be soon. Okay. It'll be soon. We'll have okay. it in front of you soon. So anyway, uh, just quickly, um, potential housing opportunity sites in our general plan when it was updated, as well as when we updated our um, zoning code, we've added mixed use all along our 41st Avenue corridor. Whenever we, we've had stakeholder meetings already, we have a survey that's on our website. What we're hearing is let's go, let's go vertical in along our... Uh, commercial corridor. And um, so what we'll be looking at is um, both north of Capitola Road and south of Capitola Road and seeing under the current zoning, what can it handle in terms of mixed use at this point to go vertical and figure out what that, for the overall zoning, what, what would work. Um, next slide, please. One item I do want to bring up is the Capitola Mall. We get a lot of public comment on, let's put it all on the mall. Uh, there's really a balance to be made there. So we are very interested in mall redevelopment. And in order to have the, the mall and the partners within the mall come forward, the answer is not to put all your affordable units on the mall. We can't put that burden on them. So just we, we will be strategic in when we're looking at the mall site and assigning units. Yes, it's a great place to go vertical and have a mix of housing, but it would not be appropriate to over, be overly burdensome as our mall is in desperate need of redevelopment. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so housing site opportunity examples. Uh, Veronica had put this together. It's a 1.5 acre site. It's where Dharma's is. Um, it's in the community commercial zone. Right now, there's no, um, there, there's no max in terms of density. So really, it would be up to how meeting the height limit and the parking. It is within the coastal um, coastal zone. Veronica's team, I think Brett put this together, ran ran the numbers on what could fit on this site and came up with possibly up to 31 units at 30 dwelling units per acre. So just one example. Another real example that you can look at is the Capitola Beach Suites right by um, on 41st Avenue. It's one of the last properties in Capitola as you're going towards Pleasure Point right over the rail. Um, that's I think 28 units per acre is what you see there. And it also has commercial, so it's mixed use. Uh, next slide, please. So public outreach, as I said, right now we currently have an online housing needs survey going on. Um, we conducted stakeholder interviews back in November. We um, 
have to provide public outreach per state code, which we'll be following and making sure we follow the timelines that are required in state code. And then the Planning Commission, similar to our meeting tonight, had their uh, first work session on this in February. Um, continuing the public outreach is the sea evenings meeting next week on February 16th. We're going to do a community workshop. We have flyers around town. Um, a mass email went out inviting. I sent that to you all right before the meeting so you know what the public got. Um, and then we'll have another community workshop uh, in the future and then public review of the draft housing element that has a requirement to be out to the public for um, I think Veronica said 30 days, and then we have two weeks in which a response time to respond to all comments. Um, and then after that, adoption hearings. So next slide, please. So public outreach, as I stated, we, we've got our flyer around town, and we've got the virtual meeting. So that's 6.30 to 7.30 next Thursday, and it's on our web page as the, when you turn, when you go to City of Capitola. Next slide. And then next steps is to proceed with the site's inventory analysis. We're talking about uh, bringing that back to you probably within a month, month and a half. Um, draft housing element update, we'll publish that in probably late March, early April. Then the 30-day public review period and 15 days for the city to respond. The HCD gets 90 days, so. <laughs> um, to, to review our drafts, so we're thinking that will happen from uh, over the summer months. And then when we get back from our summer uh, break, we will jump into the public hearings for adoption. So, and, and running simultaneously with that will be the update to the zoning, uh, the rezones. So, next slide, please. And I just said that, so that's the other part of this. Next slide. Um, so with that, thank you. Thank you, Veronica and Brett, and we're available for questions. Thank you. Uh, that was a lot to take. take. <laughs> <laughs> Council questions? Yes. Um, so Katie, I hope for everyone listening and watching and in the audience today, um, put it in perspective. So we're going to identify 1,336 potential spots to develop on by December 31st. Fingers crossed if council, you know, if we get that far. And then we have eight years to do what? So what happens once we identify these spots for development and what's the role of the council? How do we ensure that these are built in the eight year timeline. Can you offer some perspective on that? Great question. Um, so our obligation is really to plan for the 1300 sites. Um, and then it's up to the it's up to the property owners whether or not to come in and develop those sites. So we just have to we've got a zone for it and uh, make sure that we have capacity in the city. The other important part of this is it won't be just the 1,300 sites. We're going to ask that, that we get to a number that's a lot higher because if a developer comes in and they don't meet the numbers that we've attached to their site, so if you have a developer that we said, we want to have 20 units on that site, and they come in and they say, well, we want to build four, then if we have an abundance of sites in our inventory, we can make findings that it's okay to just make four because we can we have zoned for a much higher number. I'm going to let them help with the sound real quick because it's echoing, and then I'm going to just like if there's some weird. I was going to suggest maybe we take a quick little oh, break. Something just happened on. very weird. Oh, <laughs> the Zoom. So okay, I think well, we're going to try to see if we can. I didn't even see that behind me. Yeah, right. it, it was better. interesting when it happened. It looked a little bit like a, uh, oh, oh, just a Star Wars episode. Actually. Yeah, it did. <laughs> it totally did. Are we still connected with? We go oh, back to we're gonna move that old like Microsoft screensaver from like the nineties. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be able to hear her. She I ran the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, how do we go back to Zoom though? Click on that. Oh, here, right. Weird. Weird. So I'm gonna say no to that. Does it look like we're that on Zoom, that. or is it just our? We're not doing that. Sharing. 
Um, Veronica, can you turn off? Oh, she doesn't have her share screen on. Okay. Hit share screen here. Do yeah, I don't it? have my share screen. It, it's trying to share. <laughs> It's, it's going back. It's, it's sharing itself is what it's doing. What if you share the PowerPoint? <laughs> try, sharing. try sharing now. Yeah, press share. Just, just, okay. What if you share just the PowerPoint and not the screen? There we go. Now try stop and share. Oh, yeah. I see what you're saying. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we don't need to see Veronica, okay. correct? No. Right. We just need to be able to hear her. So I don't... I don't know what people at home can see. At home? Who's seeing this? The Star light show. Mm -hmm. dance party. We don't need to be, <laughs> this computer doesn't need to be in Zoom, though, because Veronica. Oh. Yes. So let's just, I'm just going to end this. And if that ruins it, that's on me. <laughs> but we should still be able to, um, you can get to the slides if you need to. And Did we, we just end the Zoom for everybody? No. Or, oh, no. okay. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you for Good. <laughs> break. Uh, Jamie really wanted to talk about the sites. <laughs> that maybe had some great ideas there. So, um, so to so we don't need to no. There's no obligation to build. It's just that the, we have to plan. The, now, but it's a requirement of the state, right? And so we have until 2031 to what essentially? Essentially, make sure that our zoning map and our zoning uh, ordinance can uh, allow for those those sites to be developed. Okay. And then it's up to planning commission and council to approve the projects as they come in, following all the new laws and, and things that have passed over Correct. the time. And, okay. I just wanted to offer that information to, yeah. to offer some perspective. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. I have some questions about the outreach. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, so you said there was emails sent out and these flyers. I'm curious, um, how many people were the emails sent out to? Um, so I sent emails to everyone on our like boards and commissions. And any we've been on our website, we've had a link that if you're interested, please email. They'd send emails to me. So I've been creating a list. Okay. And um, hundreds, maybe. A couple hundred. Yeah, hundred at least okay. went out. But. And what about these flyers? Um, where are they being posted and how many? There, uh, there's about maybe 75 at the library. Nikki has some at the rec center and then we have them upstairs. Are you using social media to promote this as well? Yes, and I'll be, I've, uh, I think Chloe will be helping me with the social media piece of that. And um, in that same uh, vein, you said there were stakeholder interviews in November. I'm curious who those stakeholders were. Oh, How many so people, where you found them. Yeah, there were, I, I wanna say seven stakeholder groups. One was large employers, uh, others um, large business owners. So large employers would be like the schools, school system, school district was there. Okay, so countywide. Uh, county, um, yeah, I mean, the school district's more countywide, but it really has a focus of, we had um, the SoCal Elementary School District present because they're within Capitola for um, New Brighton Middle School. So uh, we also had local resident, a local resident group. We had a housing like activist group. We had a nonprofits who um, are focused on housing group. We had an internal staff group because uh, RRM had a lot of questions for us. And, um, and we really looked at like what hurdles exist in Capitola and what, what they think needs to be addressed in this next housing element within that group, those groups. So yeah. Um, we had a design group, like architects. I wanted to ask too, do you have uh, like demographics or any sort of information about people who are uh, submitting uh, the survey? or partaking, taking part in these um, groups. Like, I'm just curious, like how many, you know, age, gender, income, renters versus owners, because I think it would be really important to ensure that we're getting, you know, a fair representation of the residents when we're taking that as, you know, 
community input? Yes, I believe at the beginning of the survey, it asks um, whether or not you're a resident or an employee um, in Capitola or what your relationship is. And even if you're a visitor, just mm -hmm. visit Capitola. I'm not sure if we have, and I think it does ask rent or own, so we get into the housing dynamic if they, are, if they do live here. And then also, um, but I'm not sure about the age. Thank you. You're welcome. I had a question about uh, the numbers. It was interesting that Scotts Valley had a lower number than Capitola. And I, th I find that interesting because Scotts Valley is a lot more land and we have a lot less, less land. Um, and it simply said that if we meet the mandate, we don't have to see it through or the projects through. That's going to depend upon the developers. Mm -hmm. I wanted to put that out there. Yeah, so uh, Capitola is is an area, we have, we have a really high number when the HCD is assigning or in their guidance and it really it comes down to the AMBAG meetings um, at the regional AMBAG meetings. That's where we look at the formula um, for how the, how the units will be distributed. And in that formula, there's uh, new, new items that we need to look at and because it, it would seem practical that you would look at land area and understand how land area impacts uh, future housing. And we've got, um, I think when I first got here, we said we had 12 vacant lots, and now I think it's less than six. So, you know, we, we're, we're land, we don't have much opportunity in terms of vacant land. But, they, but the state, when they're assigning these numbers, it's, they really believe that density belongs, more density belongs in areas that already have density, so your cities should get more dense. And so that's why you're seeing um, our number go up. And then also, um, we're, we've got a lot of, uh, uh, our, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of the term they use at the HCD, but we, we have a lot of benefits to our residents here. We've got great schools, we've got parks, we've got, uh, we've got a lot of great, wonderful library, a lot, a lot of benefits to the community. That's another item that when they're doing the analysis mm -hmm. is they put more units in areas in which like people that need housing can flourish and uh, be in a great school system and, and have access to a wonderful library. And, um, so those, those are some parts of it. And then also uh, the racial makeup of Capitola um, it's not as diverse, so that's another thing that's looked at is to create more opportunities under fair housing. And um, so really, it, it was really interesting going through the process this year, and the laws have changed significantly since the last uh, go around. And also the numbers that, were, that came down at the state level were much higher than the last go around. I have more questions. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, so the um, places we zoned for the last housing cycle, because we didn't, those weren't developed, right? They're not, not all of them. A large percent of them weren't actually developed. Do the, the um, places we need to zone for, plan for, for this housing cycle, are those completely unique from the last housing cycle, or do we include some of the ones that weren't actually developed in the last housing cycle? Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, Veronica, do you wanna comment on the new law for- uh, Yeah, any uh, certainly. Um, the, um, there's been a lot of changes in state law and you, c you can uh, reuse the sites. Uh, so if, you have rezoned it or identified it in the previous housing element cycle and nothing ha happened on it, you can reuse the site. Now, the only problem also, it's not a problem, but you, you don't have a lot of choices. So, you know, in, in, if you don't want to rezone a lot of sites, uh, reusing sites that are feasible, also subject to the buy right without discretionary review if 20% of the units are affordable for low income. So reason past the statutory deadline was subject to that. Reusing sites that you have previously used before will, subject, will be subject to that. Um, there are also um, higher standards of what constitutes sites. Um, and so some of the sites you identify in the past may not be usable because of the size. Uh, state law says a, a parcel or site that is less than half an acre or is larger than 10 acre. 
are not feasible sites for low income housing uh, for your low income arena. So some of I, I imagine I'm just I, I don't know enough about your site's inventory at this time, but I would imagine that some of your sites in the last cycle were small sites. Um, so they, they can be reused for other income category like moderate and above moderate income. But if you're using it for low income, they need to be at least half an acre. Thank you. I have another question. Um, regarding the um, minimum and maximum units per acre that you were discussing um, and the need to um, apply zoning changes before the end of the year. Um, I'm curious, because it sounded like the goal was to maintain a maximum of 20 units per acre, but it was my understanding from the slide that 20 units per acre would be the minimum number for that is financially viable for low-income housing. I was hoping to get some clarity on that. Yeah. Oh. So, oh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, so for the for the rezone, which we need to do, the reason if if we get the rezone done, we need to um, we can put in our zoning code a minimum and a maximum. But if we go through and we add a maximum density, so right now our multifamily high density is at like 19.6. So under what's financially viable. So it's under viable. what's financially viable. So we'll probably be coming back to you and asking to bump that up to at least 20, but possibly up to 25 so that, or 30, so that people will have, it'll, it'll make sense when it gets to HCD to rezone. So if we, if we put in new, maximums and we can, under the, the new maximums, we say we can meet our density limits with these new maximums um, and rezone, then we won't be subject to the state's requirement of a minimum of 20 units per site. And is this um, the 20 units per site? Is this like for Or 20 units per acre. Yeah, per, per acre. Is that for like medium density or? It's, was it for a specific like density category? Okay. Great question. So if we assign low income housing to that site, it has to have a minimum of 20 units per acre if we have not rezoned. And so it's it doesn't matter what the zoning is, it's just if it gets assigned. So it would have income. a minimum, but wouldn't we already be putting a minimum of 20? 20 to 25 yeah. to 30, right? So if yeah. we if we rezone before the end of the year, we won't be subject to that. Yeah, and Katie, years. if I can um, kind of supplement that, um, you know, the 1,400 units that you're faced with, um, you, you could do 30 units to the acre, 35 units to the acre, and in some areas, maybe then, then you don't have as many, you don't have to have, identify that many sites, you know. But what we are trying to um, avoid is the bottom. When you have a zone, zoning district, you always have a range, right? The bottom range and the upper range. Um, so if we're able to get to the rezoning before the end of the year, your, your upper range has to be at least 20, like the maximum has to be the minimum maximum has to be at least 20 units to the acres, but you can go to 35, 40, whatever you want to, but you don't have to have a bottom. Like, or you can establish the bottom at whatever you choose to. But if you can't get to your rezoning by the end of the year, the maximum density would be 20, 25, 30 units to the acre, but the bottom has to be 20. So you, you're not going to, when you have a zoning district that is like 20 to 30 units to the acre, if you, if you the range is 20 to 30 units to the acre, let's say, um, if you get to the rezoning um, past the end of the year, then you cannot accept a project that comes in at 19.5 units to the acre because your bottom is 20. So you cannot have like a townhome project that comes in at 19.5 units to the acre. Thank you. All right. Um, I did have a question that I may be getting ahead of us here, um, but would we be, 
as far as ADUs, um, would we be identifying private property that would be able to sustain ADUs and reaching out to those property owners, or is that something? So we'll base it on trends. We'll be looking at Capitola and how our trends have been um, in ADUs have increased over time. And I, you know, this past year, um, we've been seeing a lot of traction and the council, you know, we've put a lot of money into it, like the, the guidance documents for ADUs. And so we're hoping to see that bump up for last year's numbers. But so based on trends, we can include those within our housing element. Thank you. And then I know you mentioned um, when we're reviewing sites, um, we'll be, when they're being looked at and looked into certain problem areas will be sought. And I know that from the public standpoint, there's gonna be a lot of um, questions about uh, traffic and water and infrastructure, things like that. Um, so I'm just, I think, because a lot of people think about the mall and they're just wondering about how it's going to affect the 41st corridor and the residents around it. And so just taking that as an example, um, I guess what's something that we can put forth to the public stating that this is something that will be addressed in, in a development, right? So it's you don't just slap on a unit with all these parcels on it and just not think about how it's gonna affect traffic or water or infrastructure. So I think if that's something that can be really transparent or that like at least, I know it's a question that I get asked a lot, like when we talk about the mall is, well, what about this, what about that? And just to have these ideas sort of churning and formulating, I, and again, I think I'm getting ahead of our steps because I know we're talking about rezoning, but I think that's just something that um, would be helpful for us to understand a little bit better too and have the, the lingo and the jargon when we're moving forward um, in the rezoning and all that. So that's sort of more of a comment. <laughs> well, I, I think, you know, part of this is a CEQA analysis. They, they have a, another consultant they're working with that will be looking at CEQA, so your environmental review. Okay. Um, so that, that will be included as part of this package. And also in the rezoning, there's a CEQA requirement to look at overall, like if, while we're rezoning, we have to look at the impacts to um, to our environment and built environment as well. So the streets and okay, connections. Great. Did, were there any last council questions? Okay, um, we can go out to public comment. I see nobody. Awesome. Great, welcome JM, you have been allowed to speak. You can unmute yourself and you'll have three minutes. Uh, hello guys, I hope everyone's having a good night. Uh, I heard Veronica Tam say that 67% of our assigned AMBAG units is because we didn't build anything for 20 years. Uh, I'm wondering if I heard correctly. And I also wonder if we had representation on AMBAG uh, during this process, thank you. Great. You can respond. So the um, the sixty percent increase was I and Veronica. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was for the um, not just specific to Capitola, but on a statewide um, and looking at our state and our region. That was not just based on Capitola. So that did not come into the formula when the um, units were divvied up at the MBAG level. So just to clarify that point, that's at the state level. And the second question. Um, yeah, I think um, I think it's pretty well known by the speaker and others that I'm the representative for AMBAG and oh. I was the uh, AMBAG representative last year when we went through the RENA process. Um, there's minutes for those meetings, I believe on the AMBAG website, as well as minutes for the meetings that we had for what, eight, eight, six, eight months that we discussed the RENA process and I brought it up here at council that it was coming down and how it was gonna work out and uh, fought pretty hard for the city of Capitola at the time and, and here we are. Yeah, great. And it, I recollect that the city council submitted multiple letters to Amber. So. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you.
And just can we just clarify because the speaker, um, the suggestion was that because we didn't build, we had those additional right. percentages. Yeah, but can we just clarify again that it's not our responsibility yeah. to build, it's our responsibility to be builder friendly, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just two points I would add to that. Number one is is that it's the city's responsibility to create the zoning. I think that's what Veronica Tan, that's what housing elements do, is the city needs to create the zoning necessary to accommodate the RENA units. And in addition, we heard from our uh, consultant this evening that they also recommend a buffer. So you want to accommodate more than just the exact 1336, right. they recommend a buffer. But the other one I just want to answer very directly is there was nothing in the formula from AMBAG that had anything to do with what Capitol has done in the past. It was our demographics and it was um, our demographics and our, our risk. Our risk yeah. and yeah, there was just a m number of factors, but nothing that looked and said, oh, Capitol, you only built 12 units in the last 10 years or three years or whatever, so therefore. Want to make sure it's all looking ahead and looking at our sort of intrinsic characteristics. Right. That's why it sets us apart. So, do we have anybody else online that would like to speak? Okay. Well, we can go back. Um, do we have to make a motion, or are we just? Okay. I have a quick comment. Though, yes, please. Yeah. Comment. Um, yeah. I mean, as I mentioned, when we were going through the AMBAG arena process, I kind of talked here and there at council meetings about what a difficult process this was going to be when it came to us, and now here we are. Uh, I don't envy you, Katie and staff, for the work that you're gonna have to do. We have a lot of work ahead of us, and if it's not um, you know, already clear, I'll just point out to our um, friends out in the Bay Area region are about a year ahead of us in terms of their fifth cycle uh, RENA process, and of the 109 cities and counties in the Bay Area, only, I think it was 14, submitted their housing element on time by the January 31st deadline. Um, so it's a really complicated and complex process and hopefully we won't be in that same boat. Um, but just as kind of a, a sign of, of what's ahead of us is that's a, to, to learning that statistic was pretty shocking to me and made me mm -hmm. think that, you know, this is gonna be a really hard and complex process, but I know that uh, we're all ready. And if we're not ready, we're about to be. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. I encourage the community to take the housing survey. Um, and it, again, as we move forward, as the mayor mentioned, a lot of people have concerns about traffic and infrastructure. And of course, those are valid concerns. Um, but let us also remember that density is, is essentially, um, a requirement for our future at this point to be denser than we already are. Um, I, I think for something to be considered a very high density is like 75 units an acre, 76 units an acre, something like that. And we're not even considering that. So what might be considered a high density here in Capitola is not what would be considered high density um, by the standards, I suppose you would call it. Um, so let's just keep an open mind for, for what we are preparing our city for. Um, and yeah. Let's get it done. Yeah, I, I agree. I think this was informative to me too. I think moving forward, this was a snapshot into the future. It's not um, these steadfast buildings are gonna go up by the end of the year and we're just here for that. So thank you, Katie, for all your work. Thank you, Kristen, for all your work with AMBAG. Um, and yeah, we. I look forward to seeing, hopefully we're not part of that statistic of not reaching our numbers. Um, okay. A question yeah um and sort of a statement too not to try to complicate the project i know we're on a really tight deadline but i'm just thinking is there a way that i or other council members or other entities or groups from the city can get more involved in the process because it, it we have two workshops planned is that right mm -hmm. and then how many city council meetings are discussing this topic for so um, they'll right now what we have planned is once we come up with the locations mm -hmm. to possibly either do what we just did with the Planning Commission followed by a City Council meeting or maybe do a joint meeting uh, we'll be sending out emails and trying to if, if we go the joint meeting we'll uh, 
have to send out emails and figure out a date that would work for all 10, <laughs> which, which can prove difficult at times. But yeah, so that that's the right here right now. Once we get into adoption hearings, it's really up to the Planning Commission and City Council how many hearings that will go through. But it's really important that we get a first draft off to the HCD and continue working just right. so we meet that timeline. But um, opportunities for involvement, I can continue to keep you updated on where we're at, but you will be hearing from us again um, late March, early April with that first sites analysis inventory. So it's probably going to be March, we'll, so mm -hmm. not too far out. Okay. Yeah, great. I just want to make sure that um, you know, plenty of opportunities for all stakeholders to be involved um, because it is a quick process that will you know, greatly impact capital for the next eight years. And I suspect so. that once we do have that map put together, the room will be. <laughs> yeah, I'm <laughs> surprised there isn't more yeah. engagement tonight. Yeah, so. we usually make that those meetings with this is the only item on the agenda, right? Like when we have our big zoning meetings, mm -hmm. that's usually the only item. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And the rubber will hit the road when we start talking about the document. Yeah, and hopefully we'll educate the public along the way that this is zoning, it's not building. Because then there's mm -hmm. every the fear out there now is, oh my God, they're going to put 12 stories on. 41st Avenue tomorrow. Okay. Is that all you need from us? We received. Thank we you. received <laughs> the citywide housing <laughs> <laughs> item 7C. Oh, my goodness. We did. We, uh, I'll let you know. We did. Yes. General consensus. Yes. <laughs> That's a voice vote. Yes. Okay. So cool. That. Um, thank you, everybody. It brings us to item eight, which is adjournment. Appreciate you all. Have a lovely evening. Oh, adjourn. Mm -hmm.